and welcome to this video on formula equations and amount of substance. My name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and this video, the whole point of this video is to give you an overview of this uh, part of the elements for life topic for OCRB Salters um, and uh, basically it's just designed for revision to give you an idea of an overview. Um, and because it's revision, um, the slides that I'm using here, you can have access to them as well. Um, you can purchase them. If you just click on the link in the description box below and you can get a hold of them there. They're really good value for money um, and um, can really kind of complement your revision and help you to get that A star uh, or A in chemistry. Okay, so um, like I say, this is dedicated to the Salter specification and it meets these points uh, taken from the syllabus too. Okay, so just have a quick look at the atom and the structure of the atom, because um, we're going to talk about obviously uh, moles and, um, and 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 the like. So we need to know a little bit more about the structure of the atom. So just in a nutshell, we have a nucleus. It's really small. It contains protons and neutrons. We have electrons that sit in orbitals, and these obviously orbit the nucleus around it. We need to know the charges of these things as well. Protons have a relative charge of plus one, so they're positive. A mass of one neutrons are neutral and they have a mass of one electrons are minus one the relative charge is minus one and their relative mass is one over two thousand so we can't say it's zero because they do have a mass it's just very very light or very low and um, obviously in the periodic table you'll see your elements and they're written out like this the bigger number is the mass number it tells you the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the bottom number is called the atomic or proton number and this tells us the number of uh, protons in the nucleus and remember in elements the number of protons equals the number of electrons so this can also be the number of electrons in elements okay so we need to know a little bit about ions and isotopes so ions have a different number of electrons and protons you can see here oxygen has got uh, has gained two electrons this is a negative ion uh, and it would then combine with a positive ion to form a stable compound. But if we have a look at the number of protons in here, the number of protons is 8 in oxygen and has a charge of plus 8. Neutrons is 8, but they don't have a charge. Electrons, this has 10 electrons, a charge of minus 2. So overall, it has a charge of minus, uh, minus 10, sorry. So overall, it has a charge of minus 2, um, which is, this is why it's O2 minus. Looking at positive ions, something like sodium, Sodium has 11 protons uh, in the in the middle of it, uh, which has a charge of plus 11. 12 neutrons, which have a charge of 0. And it has 10 electrons, which means it has a charge of minus 10. So overall, the overall charge is plus 1. So positive ions effectively lose an electron to form the positive ion that they are here. And this is an example, which is sodium. Isotopes, these are elements with the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. So you can see here that we've got a set of three isotopes here. These are all carbon isotopes. And if we have a look here, we've got the same number of protons here across all of them. Um, so we've got six protons in each, because obviously you can see the proton number at the bottom is the same. But the number of neutrons is different. You can see here that we've got, because it's going 12, 13, 14, we've got extra neutrons, obviously, in these isotopes up here. So these ones are... Uh, obviously isotopes of each other because they have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Okay, you've got to know your definitions as well. You'll see um, these, uh, might see these crop up in your exam. So the relative atomic mass is the AR. This is the weighted mean mass of an atom, of an element, compared to one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon-12. So make sure you know that definition. Make sure you know the definition of relative isotopic mass as well. This is just the mass not a mean mass, it's just a mass of an atom of an isotope compared to 1 12th of the mass of an atom of carbon 12. So it's always this same bit at the end here. And relative molecular mass or formula mass. Um, so this is the mean mass of a molecule compared to 1 12th of the mass of an atom of carbon 12. So it's a molecule this time instead of an atom. So as long as you know these symbols, especially you might see AR and MR written uh, interchangeably as well. Okay, so let's have a look at the mole. Okay, so the mole is basically just a way of measuring something. In this case, we call it the measuring an amount of a substance. That's why we call it amount of substance. Um, and we normally shorten it to mole, M-O-L, as well. And basically, one mole of any substance will contain 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules. 
this is known as Avogadro's number. You might see it as capital N with a little A. So that's Avogadro's number. So one mole of water will contain 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 molecules of water. And one mole of iron will contain the same number, but this time it's atoms of iron. So basically, it's one mole of any substance, whether it's a molecule or an atom, um, it has that same number of, um, of them particles. Okay, and we can calculate the number of particles in a substance. Um, basically, it's dead easy. We say the number of particles is Avogadro's number times by the number of moles. And that will tell us, obviously, how many particles we have in there. Now, for example, let's have a look at this one. How many particles make up 0.67 moles of ammonia? So the number of particles is Avogadro's number times the number of moles. Avogadro's is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Multiply that by 0 0.67, which is the number of moles, and that gets us the number of particles to be 4.03 times by 10 to the 23. Uh, now, obviously, this is the number of particles that are in there. It is a large number because you can have a lot of them, but just be prepared to rearrange this formula as well. Um, you know, obviously, this is just one way of doing it, but you can, um, there will be expected you to be able to rearrange it and use it interchangeably. Okay, so the mole mass and MR. So the number of moles can be calculated from the mass and the MR or the AR. Okay, so the number of moles is mass in grams divided by MR or AR, depending on what we're working out. So for example, if we're going to calculate the number of moles of 23 grams of gold, give your answer to two significant figures. Again, look out for them significant figures. So the number of moles is mass over AR. So the number of moles is 23 because that's the mass of gold. Uh, the AR of gold is 197, so the number of moles is 0.12 moles to two significant figures. Again, be prepared to rearrange this formula, okay, because it might be used within a larger question, and you might have to use this formula there. Now, all you have to do is look in your question. If you have any two of these components here, any two of these three, then you can use this equation. So if you know, obviously, the MR and the AR, you can work out for the periodic table, um, and if you know a moles or a mass, then we can work out any one of them too. So yeah, just be prepared to be able to rearrange this and just look look in the question, see what information you've got or what you have already calculated and see if you can use this formula. Okay, the mole of solutions. So this is basically the number of moles in a substance, um, but this is in a solution this time and we're using concentration and volume. So the number of moles is basically the concentration in moles per decimeters cubed times by the volume in decimeters cubed. Make sure the volume is in them units there. If it's in centimeters cubed, which it more likely is going to be in centimeters cubed, then you need to convert to decimeters cubed. Okay, and we convert by dividing by a thousand. So you might have seen this equation as concentration times volume divided by a thousand. You might have seen it written like that. Um, just as long as your, your volume is in decimeters cubed, that's all that matters. Um, what might be make it a little bit easier is to just add times 10 to the minus 3 onto the end of the number, and that means exactly the same as divide by 1,000. And you'll see that in my examples later on. I'll just put that on the end of it, and that takes care of your units. So, for example, calculate the number of moles of 200 centimeters cubed of 0.35 moles per dm cubed of HCl. So the number of moles is concentration times volume. The concentration is 0.35, so that's it there. The volume is 200, but... Because that's in centimetres cubed, we need to convert to decimetres cubed. So all we do is we put times by 10 to the minus 3, and that converts it into decimetres cubed. So we've turned the centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed by just putting that little bit on the end there. So the number of moles is 0 0.07 moles. Okay, so you can see there, there's the times 10 to the minus 3. just emphasises where that bit has come from. Okay, and also, just like with the other one, you've got to be prepared to rearrange this formula. And just look in your question, just like before. If you've got any two of these components, um, you can use this formula here. And all of these formulas contain moles on it. So there's that saying, I like to use this saying, which is, if in doubt, work out the moles. So if you've got a set of numbers, just work out the moles of something. Because actually, from there, you can work out loads of different things. You see some of the equations here. The common theme that they've got is they've got the... Um, the mole component in there so you can interchange them quite readily if you know the moles of something okay ionic equations so ionic equations they basically show the ions that are formed in solution uh, and they show which particles are reacting to so normally these are acids bases and salts these obviously form ions in solution so here's a standard balanced equation you can see here 
and it's just an acid reacting with a base. And the equation is a full uh, is a, is fully balanced as you can see here with all your twos, etc. Now we're going to write an ionic equation underneath. Now this is called a full ionic equation. So just have a look. All we've done is we've split up our acids, our bases, and our salts, and we've split them up into their ions. Okay, water isn't an ion, so we just leave it as it is. We can see here that we've got two H pluses and we've got the SO42 minus. We've got two K pluses and OH minus. 2K2s, uh, sorry, 2Ks, 2K pluses, and 2SO4, 2 minuses. So all we've done is split them up into their ions. Water is an ion, we just leave that as it is. Again, we're looking for acids, bases, and salts. Okay, what we're gonna do is cancel any ions that appear on both sides, um, and we're just basically gonna simplify it to its simplest form. So we look on the left-hand side of the equation and look on the right and cancel out any ions which are the same. So let's go and do that. There we go, so we cancel them out, and then we just collect what we've got left. And you can see here that we've got two H pluses, two OH minuses, and that'll form two H2O. Or you can write that as H plus plus OH minus forms H2O. That's just a multiple of it. Okay, so the SO42 minus and the K plus, these are called spectator ions, and they don't actually get involved with the reaction, so they stay separate. But in this final ionic equation, the charges must balance, so make sure they do. Um, you can see here on the left we've got two pluses and two negatives. On this side it's neutral, so actually we have a neutral on this side, a neutral on this side, so it is balanced. So just make sure it is balanced because it should be. Okay, so looking at these state symbols, you're going to see these quite a bit as well. Um, S stands for solids, L are liquids, G is gases, and AQ is aqueous. That basically means anything dissolved in water. So balanced equations, these can be used to work out a theoretical mass. So calculating the theoretical mass from this equation is pretty straightforward. So we're going to say how much calcium oxide can be made when 34 grams of calcium is burnt completely in oxygen. So let's have a look. The first thing we need to do is we need to write out our equation and we need to balance it. Now you might see this form of calculation be particularly useful for when you're working out the percentage yield of something and um, because in the percentage yield uh, equation which you'll which you might have seen um, you have your um, theoretical mass and this is basically what we're trying to work out here a theoretical mass so this would be useful for this as well but anyway write out the equation make sure it's balanced you can see uh, there it is and it's all balanced then we need to work out the MR and the AR of the species involved I'm going to write these as masses in grams so you can see we've got two lots of calcium Calcium's got a, a mass of 40, a relative mass of 40, times that by 2, which gives us 80. Calcium oxide is 50, um, 56, and we've got two of them, so we multiply by 2, so that gives us 112. And what we do is convert these into masses. So we're saying 80 grams of calcium will form 112 grams of calcium oxide. The oxygen bit we can ignore because it's not we're not referring to it in the in the question. And then all we do is we divide the calcium side by 80 to find 1 gram and then multiply by 34 to get what 34 grams is because we want to know how much does 34 grams of calcium produce, not what 80 grams produces. And then what we're going to do is just do the same on the other side. So here it goes. Divide by 80 to find 1 gram, multiply by 34 to get 34 grams. And we do exactly the same on the other side. So it's 112 divided by 80 will give 1.4 grams, and 1.4 grams times 34 will give 47.6 grams. And this is, in theory, this is the maximum amount of calcium oxide we can produce from 34 grams of calcium. Okay, we can't produce any more than this. And this is the, in a perfect world, that's how much we would get. Okay, so like I say, that's the theoretical mass. Okay, so the empirical formula. This is the simplest whole number ratio of elements in a compound. So let's have a look at an example. So a compound contains 23.3% magnesium, 30.7% sulfur, and 46.0% oxygen. What is the empirical formula of this compound? Okay. So, sorry about that, that's my phone. Um, so what we've got here is we've got, uh, it never stops ringing. Right, write out the elements involved. So you can see here we've got Mg, we've got S, and we've got O. Okay, so we've got all these different components here. So we've got magnesium, we've got sulfur, and we've got oxygen. Okay, these are just the elements that we were given in the question. 
Then what we have to do is we write out the percentages as masses. And you can see here that the masses, you can see here that the masses are written here as just a percentage. So we've got 23.3% magnesium, it's 23.3 grams, and sulfur is 30.7 grams, because that's 30.7%, and 46.0% oxygen is 46.0 grams. Now what we do is divide these uh, by the relative atomic mass to get the number of moles. So we divide each one of these by the relative atomic mass, which is 24.3, obviously for magnesium. Sulfur is 32.1, oxygen 16. So you just use your periodic table. And then what we get is this ratio here, 0.96, 0.96, 2.88. 0 and then all we do is we then divide by the smallest number of moles, because that's what we've just worked out there. The smallest one was 0.96, so we divide all of them by 0.96. So that one, that one, and that one. And we should get this ratio 1 to 1 to 3. And then once we've done that, we just need to write down our final formula. So our empirical formula is MgSO3. One magnesium, one sulfur, three oxygens. Remember to write your empirical formula as well. And obviously this is the empirical formula, but you might be asked to work out the molecular formula. And the molecular formula, all we do is we just work out the MR of this, which is your empirical formula, and we divide it by the MR of the molecular formula, which they should give you. And then we use this number basically to multiply all of the atoms in the empirical formula. So for example, if this number is 3, if we do this formula, we come out with 3, then we multiply everything in here by 3. So that should be Mg3S3O9. Okay, so we can also um, use this to the same methods, basically to work out the uh, empirical formula of a hydrocarbon when it's being burnt, and we look at its combustion products. So let's have a look at this example. A hydrocarbon combusts completely to make 0.845 grams of CO2 and 0.173 grams of water. What is the empirical formula of the hydrocarbon? So you can see here, we write down our headings. Instead of the elements, we're going to write down our combustion products. So we're going to put carbon dioxide and water at the top here. Just like before, we're going to write down the masses of each molecule. Again, they've just given us the masses straight up, so that makes it a bit easier. 0.845 grams of carbon dioxide, 0.173 grams of water. Then we divide these by the relative molecular masses to get the number of moles. Again, just like we did last time, so the relative molecular mass of carbon dioxide is 44. Relative molecular mass of water is 18. We divide them two, and then we get the number of moles here. Now, this is the number of moles of carbon dioxide, and that's the number of moles of water. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So, we've got one mole of carbon dioxide has one mole of carbon atoms. Okay, so one mole of this has one mole of carbon atoms. So, the original hydrocarbon must have had this many moles of carbon atoms. Okay, because this is the only place where the carbon would have come from. So... Uh, one molecule of this will produce one, uh, one atom of carbon. So we say the number of moles here is the same as the number of moles of carbon atoms. On this side, though, one mole of water has two moles of hydrogen atoms, you can see here. So the original hydrocarbon must have had the number of moles of water times by two. So it's 0 0.096 times two, which is 0 0.0192 moles of hydrogen atoms. So remember, the carbon and carbon dioxide and the hydrogen in water can only come from the hydrocarbon. And this is why we're mainly focusing on the carbon and the hydrogen bit, because we want to know what the ratio is of carbon to hydrogen atoms. And then all we do is you divide by the number of carbon, or divide the number of carbon and hydrogen atoms by the smallest number of moles. Now in this case, the number of moles is the same. So we're just going to divide them by 0.019 divided by 0.019, and obviously that's just going to be the same. So we just get a one-to-one -one ratio, and then our empirical formula should be just CH in this example. Okay, so calculating the water of crystallization. Again, very similar to the, um, the format of empirical formula. So we can carry out an experiment to work out the value of water of crystallization, and heating... Um, heating most hydrated salts, we remove that water of crystallization, and what we're left with is a dry anhydrous salt. Anhydrous just meaning without water. So let's have a look at an example. 1.88 grams of hydrated calcium sulfate, CaSO4 dot XH2O, because it contains water, we don't know how many, was heated until there was no more water of crystallization was left in the sample. 
Okay, the mass of this anhydrous compound is 1.13 grams. Work out the value of X, um, which is the amount of water of crystallization. Okay, so remember X is basically how many water molecules do we have attached to the calcium sulfate? Just see this a little bit like a sponge. A sponge can only hold a certain amount of water. Um, and basically we can measure that amount of water um, by squeezing, wringing the sponge out, and we can see how much water is left. And we can have a dry sponge, which is a sponge with no water, so we call that an anhydrous sponge. Or we can have a hydrated sponge, which is just a sponge with water. But we just want to know, look, what, how much water can we hold per sponge? And it's the same with this. The calcium sulfate is a bit like the sponge, and that's the water. So they're kind of separated. That's why we put the dot there. Okay, so we work out the two molecules involved. We've got the calcium sulfate bit, and we've got the water bit. Now what we have to do is we write down the masses of each molecule. So we write down the mass of uh, calcium sulfate. Now the key thing here is obviously just looking at the numbers, which is 1.13 grams. That's calcium sulfate because it was anhydrous. And all we have to do to work out how much water was in there, obviously this was the mass of hydrated. So we do 1.88 minus 1.13, and that will give us um, obviously our mass of water, which is gonna be 0.75 grams. Okay, this is how much was lost when we um, dried our sample. Then what we do is you divide these by the relative molecular mass and we get the number of moles. So obviously the relative molecular mass of calcium sulfate is 136. The relative molecular mass of water is 18. We divide them and we get the number of moles. So this is the number of moles of calcium sulfate. That's the number of moles of water. Then what we do is divide the numbers by the smallest number of moles. So the smallest number of moles is 0 0.0083. So that gets us one. And that is the smallest number of moles. Obviously, we divide both by the smallest number of moles. Uh, and if we do this sum, we should get five. And so that means we have uh, the moles of water of crystallization is five. So the value of X is five. So the final formula would be CaSO4 dot five H2O. So in other words, for every molecule of this, we have five molecules of water surrounding it. So that is basically how much water it can hold. So it's a reasonable amount. Okay, percentage yield. This is uh, the bit I was talking about where you had to work out your theoretical mass. This is the bit where we're gonna use it here. So percentage yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times by 100. So the theoretical yield is the amount of a product produced, assuming no products are lost and all reactants react fully. So um, obviously we've worked out the um, theoretical uh, the theoretical yield already. We've just shown you that, that method of doing so. Okay, so this is basically just a way in which we can use that to work out a percentage yield. So in a reaction involving the complete combustion of calcium, 32.6 grams of calcium oxide was produced. The theoretical mass is 47.6. Now I'm just using this number as an example. Obviously you'd have to work this out specifically, um, but this is just to show you how to use this equation. Calculate the percentage yield of this reaction. Okay, so like I say, you have to calculate that bit yourself. This is just here as an example. So the percentage yield is dead easy really. It's actual yield, they'll give you the actual yield, which is 32.6, divided by the theoretical yield, which in this case, obviously we've given this as an example, 47.6 but you'd have to work that out separately 47.6 times by 100 and we get a percentage yield of 68.5 percent for this particular reaction okay and just remember um yield is never 100 percent. you always lose some products when you're transferring it from beaker to beaker um you might not get all your reactants reacting they might not fully react so it's really difficult incredibly difficult in fact virtually impossible really to get 100 percent yield Okay, so let's have a look at some practical technique. Okay, so we're gonna look at making a standard solution. So standard solutions are used in titrations and they have a known concentration. So in this example, we're gonna assume that we know the concentration of the chemical in the burette, okay? This is because we've made it as a standard solution, which I'll show you how to make in a minute. And in the conical flask, um, we're gonna titrate this standard solution against an unknown concentration, which is gonna sit in the conical flask. Now standard solutions, these are made from solids or they can be made from more concentrated liquids known um, with a known mass or concentration. And we dissolve it in water uh, to a fixed volume. And this flask in particular can hold 250 centimeters cubed or 250 mils, okay? And from that actually we can work out the concentration as well. 
Uh, and we're going to need to know how to make this. So we need to know, obviously, um, what we're going to do with it. And you need to know this method as well. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we weigh out the amount of solid precisely. So imagine we're going to make a standard solution from a solid. So weigh it out precisely. We use a balance. We have to use a plastic or glass weighing boat. And I'll explain later in a minute why we have to use a plastic or glass one. Next thing we have to do is transfer. And we're going to transfer the solid from the weighing boat into the beaker. Okay, so we've weighed it. We've got the amount we want. And we're going to tip it in. Then we have to wash any solid left behind into the beaker using deionized water. Now that's the reason why we use a plastic or a glass one. If we use a paper weighing boat, we can't wash a paper weighing boat because it will go all soggy. So using a plastic or a glass one allows us to wash out our any solid that might be left behind into the beaker. We use deionized water because it doesn't contain any uh, ions that could interfere with the reaction. So it's basically just a, a, a filtered water. Then we dissolve it. So we dissolve the solid fully and we're using deionized water. We're going to stir it with a glass rod uh, and basically that just ensures that it's fully dissolved. Then once we've dissolved it, we then have to transfer it again. Uh, and we're going to transfer it this time into a volumetric flask. We're going to use a funnel, obviously, to put it into the volumetric flask because it has a narrow neck on it. Uh, and that's to avoid any spillage. Again, we've got to rinse that beaker that we've just transferred it from and the glass rod as well. We've got to rinse everything with deionized water and make sure you haven't left any solid residue left behind in there. And all your solid that you weighed out in the first step is going into your volumetric flask. Okay, and then what we have to do is fill it. So we fill the uh, fill it to with deionized water to the graduation line. That's the little marker at the, on the neck of the uh, volumetric flask. Never go above it, otherwise you've diluted it too much. Uh, we always use a pipette when we get near to the um, uh, the graduation line um, just to make sure that we are really accurate. Remember reading from the bottom of the meniscus. And then we've got to mix it. So once we've done that, put the lid on the top, obviously, and then invert it. Give it a good mix. Make sure it's uh, we've got an even distribution of them of that solid that we dissolved in there. And that is pretty much your standard solution. So we know, obviously, the mass and we know the volume. Uh, so therefore, we can work out the concentration uh, of this standard solution. <coughs> okay, so let's look at the calculation to do with this. So what mass of solid sodium hydroxide is required to make 250 centimetres cubed of 0.75 moles per dm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution? So what we have to do is we have to work out the number of moles of the solution you want to make. So basically... Um, the number of moles is concentration times by the volume. Okay, um, so we know the concentration is 0.75 moles per dm cubed because that's how much, that's the strength we want. And we know we want 20, 250 centimetres cubed of it. Remember, we have to convert to uh, decimeters cubed. So we put times 10 to the minus 3 on the end of it. That just means the same as dividing by 1,000. Um, and that gets us 0.1875 moles. And then what we have to do is use the number of moles from the previous step to calculate the mass. So the mass is the number of moles times by the relative formula mass in grams per mole. So basically that's going to be 0.1875 times by 40. Okay, so 40 is the relative formula mass of sodium hydroxide and that's going to give us 7.5 grams. And that is basically how much sodium hydroxide, solid sodium hydroxide we need to make this strength and this volume of sodium hydroxide solution. Okay, yeah, just a reminder, obviously, that relative formula mass has, uh, has a, a value of 40. Okay, so we can calculate the volume of a more concentrated solution um, to, use, um, to use to make a standard solution. So the volume to use equals the final concentration divided by the initial concentration times by that volume that's required. So basically, this is the volume of dilute solution that we need. Okay, so this is the volume of the concentrated solution we're going to use. Okay, so make sure you can distinguish between these two. Okay, the final concentration, this is just the concentration of the final solution that you need. And the initial concentration, this is the concentration of the solution you are diluting down. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. So if we want to make a 250 centimeter cubed solution, of 0.75 moles per dm cubed hydrochloric acid from two and a half moles per dm cubed HCl. 
uh, the volume of the more concentrated HCl would be. Okay, so you can see here that we've got our more concentrated solution here. This is the really concentrated 2.5 molar HCl, but we want to dilute it down. But we need to know how do we how much water do we add and what the dilution should be if we're going to uh, make 250 centimeter cubed of it. So what we have to do is we put our numbers in. So this is going to be 0.75. Remember, this is the um, obviously this is the volume of the more concentrated. This is what we're this is what we're trying to work out. So this is the uh, the final concentration, which is 0.75. That's what we want to make divided by the initial concentration, which was 2.5. So that was the the concentrated HCl that we're going to start with times that by 250 because that's the volume that we require which is 250 centimeters cubed of this weaker solution and we should get 75 centimeters cubed of the conch hcl is needed okay so that's how much hcl is needed we dilute that down the rest with water and we should get that strength so it's pretty clever actually and obviously um uh, lab technicians would, would need to know this because uh, they make up the solutions and um, substances for you uh, is quite often you don't do this yourself. Um, so it's the um, science technicians that are pretty much experts at this kind of thing. So, um, but um, yeah, so you, cause you don't really buy t um, two and a half molar HCL, um, you know, technicians have to make it into, um, uh, into different concentrations. You might buy three molar, for example, but we only need one molar. So they have to dilute that down to make it into one molar. Um, ready for practical use so yeah they it's pretty much their day job this stuff so okay right titrations so titrations uh, can be used to work out the concentration of an acid or an alkali okay so we have an acid or an alkali um in the burette it can be either really um, but we know the concentration of that in the burette uh, in the conical flask we have an acid or an alkali with an unknown concentration but a known volume in the conical flask and we're going to add a few drops of the indicator too and basically what we're going to do is going to add the chemical in the burette to the conical flask until the indicator changes color. Uh, this is known as the end point and we're going to add it drop by drop near the end point. Then what we have to do is just read how much chemical was added from the burette to neutralize the chemical in that conical flask. Okay, and we're always reading from the bottom of the meniscus, a bit like when we made standard solutions. Okay, um, you're always reading from the bottom of the meniscus and you must read at eye level as well. So you must get down to eye level and really make sure you're right in front of it so you can read it carefully. Okay, so um, this one is obviously reading 20 centimeters cubed. Um, so that one shouldn't say that's a bit of an error. Apologies, I shouldn't say 22 centimeters cubed. Uh, that should be 19.8. Uh, so it's not reading 19.8 on here because obviously that's 19 there. That's 19.8. So it's not reading there. We're reading at the bottom of the meniscus. So that should say 19.8 there. And then what we have to do is record your results to two decimal places and repeat until you get two results that are concordant with each other. So concordancy basically means that they are similar or that they are within, specifically, they are within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. And if they are, then you can use them as concordant results. Okay, and your indicators, let's just have a look at your indicators, uh, phenolphthalein and methyl orange. Okay, make sure you know the, uh, obviously how they change in acids and alkalis. Okay, titration calculations. Okay, so titrations, they can be used to work out the concentration of an acid or an alkali. So let's have a look at an example. 18.3 centimeters cubed of 0.25 moles per dm cubed HCl was required to neutralize 25 centimeters cubed of potassium hydroxide. Calculate the concentration of potassium hydroxide. Okay, so you can see here, um, we've got HCl that's in here, uh, and we've got potassium hydroxide in here. This is just an example. The first thing we have to do is write out our equation. We get it balanced. So this is just the balanced equation. It's already done for you. HCl plus potassium hydroxide plus acid plus base gives salt plus water. Then we have to do is calculate the number of moles of HCl. Is that saying? If in doubt, work out the moles. Okay, we can work out the moles of the acid here because we have a concentration and we have a volume. So the concentration of the acid was 0.25. The volume is 18.3. Again, look at the times 10 to the minus 3 bit there okay make sure we convert into decimeters cubed first so we just add the times 10 to the minus 3 it's the same as dividing by a thousand and that gets us the number of moles of 4.58 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles 
We then use the equation to work out the molar ratio in order to work out the number of moles of KOH, okay, because that's what we want to work out. So this is called stoichiometry, okay, very long word. Uh, so we just have a one-to-one -one ratio you can see here, so there's no numbers in front of that. Um, so therefore, the moles of HCl is basically the same as the moles of potassium hydroxide. So the moles of potassium hydroxide is 4.58 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles. And then finally, from that, we can now work out the concentration. And this is moles divided by volume. So um, the number of moles we've just worked out here of potassium hydroxide, 4.58 times by 10 to the minus 3, divided by the volume, 25 times by 10 to the minus 3 again, Look at that um, that bit there. We have to convert to decimeters cubed first. Uh, and that gives us the number of moles, uh, the concentration, sorry, to be 0.18 moles dm cubed of potassium hydroxide. Okay, so we can also use them to work out the volume of an acid or an alkali as well. So let's have a look at this example. 15.7 centimeters cubed of 0 0.450 moles per dm cubed of H2SO4 was required to neutralize 0 0.120 moles per dm cubed of sodium hydroxide. Calculate the volume of sodium hydroxide being neutralized in centimeters cubed. Okay, so again, just like before, we're going to write our equation and balance it. Um, so that's it, balance there. Hyd uh, sulfuric acid plus sodium hydroxide produces sodium sulfate, that's your salt plus water. Um, this time we're going to put sulfuric acid in here and sodium hydroxide in there. Uh, then we need to work out the number of moles of sulfuric acid. So moles is concentration times volume. So concentration is 0.45. Again, make sure that's converted to um, decimeters cubed. There it is there. Okay, so we'll put that times 10 to the minus 3 on to convert to decimeters cubed. And that gives us 7.07 .07 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles. Then we do a 1 to 2 ratio. Okay, um, we have a look at one two ratio. We've got a one ratio here, uh, which is sulfuric acid, that's one, and two here, which is sodium hydroxide. So it's a one to two ratio. So basically, um, um, we have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is two times the number of moles of sulfuric acid. So that's going to be two times by 7.07 .07 times by 10 to the minus three. Okay, so we've got two lots of that, and that's going to give us um, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide to be 0 0.0141 moles. Then, once we've done that, we then calculate the volume. Um, so the volume in decimeters cubed, remember, that's what we're working out, is moles divided by concentration. So the number of moles is 0 0.0141, so we've just worked out there, divided by the concentration, which they've given us, 0 0.120 moles per dm cubed, and that gets us 0 0.118 decimeters cubed, but notice, They've asked us to work out the volume in centimeters cubed, so we have to convert. So the volume in centimeters cubed, all we do is we take the volume in decimeters cubed, times it by a thousand, and that will get us it in centimeters cubed. So it's 118 centimeters cubed. Okay, we can also work out the uh, volume of an acid and alkali when we're neutralizing solids as well. So let's have a look at this example. 0.72 moles per dm cubed of HCl was used to neutralize 2.7 grams of strontium hydroxide. So this is the solid bit. There it is there, strontium hydroxide. Calculate the volume of HCl needed in centimeters cubed. So again, here it is here. We've got HCl in here in the burette. Solid, obviously this is showing the liquid, but um, just imagine that's a solid. So we've got solid strontium hydroxide in there. Okay. Uh, then all we have to do, again, very similar to the other ones, not much different, write out the equation and balance it. So you can see here that we've got the um, equation, strontium hydroxide and acid um, to HCl produce strontium chloride, there's your salt, and water. Then, this is a little bit different. What we have to do is calculate the molar mass of strontium hydroxide. So uh, all we do is we add obviously all these up, 87.6 is strontium, 16 is oxygen, 16 is oxygen, because we've got two of them, and two hydrogens, so that's 121.6. Then we have to use the number of moles is mass over MR, okay, which is the molar mass, that's what we've just worked out there. So the moles is, uh, the mass, sorry, is 2.7, because we were told it's 2.7 grams, divided by the molar mass, which we just worked out there. So we have 0 0.0222 moles of strontium hydroxide, that's the solid. Then we're going to use the equation to find the molar ratio, just like what we did before, um, to work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, uh, not sodium hydroxide, sorry. Uh, this should be of um, 
uh, HCL. Sorry, that's just a mistake. You can see I've obviously got that for the previous slide. That should be HCL. Um, it's the same thing. You'll, you'll, you'll see what it is. So you've got your, obviously, you've got one mole there and two HCL. So it's a one to two ratio, okay, between HCL. So the moles of HCL is two times the moles of strontium hydroxide. Um, so the moles of HCL is two times by 0 0.0222, okay, because that is the um, number of moles um, of what you just worked out here of your strontium hydroxide. So that gets us 0 0.0. 444 moles so that's the number of moles of HCl and then once we've done that we just need in, then need to work out the volume so the volume in decimeters cubed is moles divided by concentration so the number of moles is 0 0.0444 divided by the concentration which is 0 0.72 and that gets you 0 0.0617 decimeters cubed that's the volume that we're producing now obviously we have to convert that into centimeters cubed because that's what it's asked us to do so um, all we do is take that times it by a thousand just like before and we get 61.7 centimeters cubed was required so actually the burette is going to have to be uh, bigger than the standard 50 that you'd use but this one's going to use 100 anyway okay and that's it and um, that's just an overview um of the formula equations and the amount of substance um Please subscribe to this channel and show your support for it. Um, all these things are free to use. I do all this in my spare time. Um, so it would be really grateful if you can show your support for it. And just by subscribing, if you just click on that middle button there uh, and you can subscribe to the channel and stay up to date with all the new videos that we put on. Um, and also these slides, and I will make all the, obviously all the changes that are needed on here, the little the little errors on there, the little gremlins that we've got through, uh, they'll all be changed. Um, but they are available to purchase. If you just click on the link, um, in the description box, you can get a hold of them um, there. They're really great value for money. But um, that's it now. Bye-bye.